Welcome to All Things Cardio-Oncology. My name is Steve Caselli. I'm the Executive Director of ICOS. And in this podcast, you'll hear from a diverse representation from our community. We want you to be both informed and inspired by their stories and experiences, and we're so glad that you've joined us today. It's a pleasure to welcome, as usual, my co-host for this podcast, Dr. Arjun Ghosh. Arjun, live from London. Welcome. How are you doing? Doing well. Really looking forward to this episode. And Dan Lanahan joining us from the center of the U.S., St. Louis, Missouri area. Welcome, Dan. Thanks, Steve and Arjun, and I look forward to hearing our uh, speakers today uh, with always a really interesting uh, presentation about how we can do a better job with pediatric cardio-oncology. Yeah, as many of you know, we have a number of special interest working groups as part of our organization, including a pediatrics working group. And today we're joined by Dr. Casey Ledger, who's a member of that working group. Casey is a pediatric oncologist at Seattle Children's Hospital. She also leads the children's oncology group, Myeloid Cardiotoxicity Working Group. So welcome, Casey. It's good to have you. Hi, Steve. Thanks. It's good to be here. We're also joined today by Dr. Will Border. Will is the Chief Physician Wellness Officer and Director of Non-Invasive Imaging at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta and a Professor of Pediatrics at Emory University School of Medicine. Will, welcome. Thank you. Great to be here. Well, we always like to hear uh, a brief a summary of from our guests about sort of their career path and in particular how they developed their interest in cardio-oncology. So Casey, I wonder if you could just tell us a little about your career, how you um, got an, interested in pediatrics and then in uh, pediatric cardio-oncology in particular. Yeah, um, sure. So I am a pediatric oncologist here in Seattle, and I focus on the clinical care of uh, patients with leukemia and lymphoma. And we have, um, you know, populations, especially in the AML um, population that receive, you know, pretty high doses of anthracyclines and have a striking um, impact on their long-term cardiovascular outcomes. And so I think pretty early in my training was struck by the um, both kind of the acute cardiotoxicity that we were seeing in the AML population um, but then also, you know, really understanding the longer term impacts that our families deal with even beyond um, their cancer journey. And so um, was really drawn pretty early on in my training toward the cardio-oncology field and um, became interested in trying to understand how we could predict who is at greatest risk for cardiotoxicity and, you know, try to um, understand how to better preserve cardiac function during and following therapy. And so I, um, over the last several years, have been involved with the Children's Oncology Group. The AML committee is really focused on trying to improve uh, cardiac outcomes for this population. And we've been um, ex- studying uh, a liposomal formulation of anthracycline, really that I think the committee is largely focused on its efficacy because it's a combination of donorubicin and cytarabine that um, have uh, particular, um, you know, some favorable pharmacokinetic properties from a myeloid treatment standpoint, but also has the potential for cardioprotection due to its liposomal encapsulation. So we've been really um, fortunate to have the opportunity to do some detailed phenotyping of um, cardiac function throughout therapy and try to understand if this liposomal agent is protective and um, and have been able to also look on the standard arm at desrosoxane. So um, it's been a, a exciting sort of journey of, of learning about how to study this in the pediatric population in, you know, a, a oncology consortium. Thank you so much. It's uh, We really appreciate your work on in our working group as well. So thank you for that. Will, tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah, so I'm primarily an echocardiographer. So I sit in dark rooms and looking look at echoes uh, day in and day out. And uh, my research interests have been in cardiac function, both systolic and diastolic function, and also looking at um, cardiac function during exercise, so under stress echo. Um, but what I was seeing was 
we'd be looking at an echo and um, a patient either in acute uh, acute phase of their cancer treatment or even an, in survivor clinic. And I would see decreased function. And we always compare the current echo with the prior echo. And I'd look at the prior echo of, of a year ago and the function was, was normal. Um, and just both in acute and, and long-term survivors. And it started to... I started to think, well, how could we pick up on this earlier and do something about it rather than wait till they drop off the cliff? And I think we had a bit of a simplistic, almost a binary variable cut point in EF, you know, above 55, you're normal, below you're abnormal. Well, what if you were 75 and then the next year you were 73 and the next year you were 70? And so... That's really where I started to become interested in, and collaborated with uh, an oncology group here in Atlanta and then also um, became involved with Casey and Eric Chow out in Seattle about w- whether we could get some signals from, you know, those 10 echoes that we've done before in this 18-year-old who now falls off the cliff of dysfunction, you know, were there echo signals that we could have picked up on earlier? So that's that was sort of my entry point into into this avenue of, of clinical and research interest. Thanks so much for that context. That's super helpful. Arjun, Dan, what questions do you have for our guest today? I was just trying to keep my mouth shut because I had about 10. Uh, so I've already forgotten about five of them. So let, <laughs> we'll go back to the ones I remember. But the, so there's been a I mean, actually, a lot of our cancer survivorship approaches have come from the childhood oncology group. So uh, as you are certainly well aware, I mean, a lot of our long-term cancer survivor information comes from that group. So we're we're huge fans of of that uh, consortium and uh, pretty much anything that comes from there we're going to have great interest in. But uh, just from what you were saying about the new uh, leukemia drug that that is a uh, combination therapy, basically, including uh, liposomal, disres- or liposomal doxorubicin plus cytarabine that has been studied in adults and has shown, uh, you know, improved progression-free survival in a, you know, adult leukemia population. And so I'm encouraged to hear that that's going to be applied in the, in the children's population too. I think that's, that's quite exciting, but we also pay close attention to the recent paper about desert oxane in, in, uh, you know, that Eric Chow was, I think he was the first author. And we actually did a, a webinar about two weeks ago, exactly on that particular paper. And, uh, you know, I found that paper to be really well done. Uh, there's, of course, a lot of critic, you know, potential criticism, criticism when you start talking about strain. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily just apply to children. It certainly applies in the adult population, too, because it's a a very sensitive indicator. Uh, So how do you see all this? You know, we're, we're, we're always in this place where children and adults have, uh, they're obviously all humans. So, you know, they have similar biology, but, but the, the biology is a little different between a child and an adult. And, you know, how do you see that we can transition the research that's done in the in the childhood cancer patient uh versus you know what what happens in adults you know and then the this segues into the next question which is you know where do you sort of cut the you know the the cutoff for when a patient is no longer being seen by the pediatric team and now they're the in the adult world you know where's the cutoff there so there's always a lot of conversations about those things. So I'd be interested to hear what you guys have to say about those two issues. How do we how do we apply research done in children to to our adult population? Uh, I think we can apply it quite well. But then, you know, when when do we say that, you know, this child is now an adult? Yeah, 
Um, yeah, I can certainly talk about like kind of our tra- um, transition of child or children to our adult program, but just trying to think about how to answer your question about how we apply our research to the adult patient. Are you, Dan, are you asking about um, like a adult patient that's treated for cancer and how we can apply sort of survivorship learnings from the pediatric population? Uh, okay, yeah, let me let me try to zero in my question a little better. But but if we do a study using desertoxane, for example, mm-hmm. in children, mm-hmm. you know, can we just say that this applies in adults or vice versa? So the example of the of the leukemia drug that you were talking about, the combination anthracycline, cytarabine, that has been proven in in adults to be helpful yeah. for certainly for high risk leukemia. And so, you know, can you apply that information to children? And, you know, the, the, the counter argument is in, in this ch- childhood study with desertoxane, can we apply that information to adults? I see. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really important to recognize um, that pediatric cancers um, often have different biology than adult cancers. And so um, AML, for example, the types of mutation or somatic drivers of AML um, is very, look very different in adults compared to pediatrics. And I think we've certainly seen that um, through a lot of the um, next generation sequencing that has happened over the last decade. Um, and so I think when it comes to efficacy, we have to be really careful about just applying, you know, adult data to pediatrics. And on the flip side, I think toxicity um, is also very different because the um, the children are coming at their therapy typically with a lot less comorbidities than the adult population have. Most often kids don't have the, um, the cardiometabolic risk factors. Um, and so I think that their baseline degree of risk is a little bit different. Um, we also use some different combinations of chemotherapy. Um, and so in Eric Chow's study, for example, it was patients with Hodgkin's lymphoma, T lymphoblastic lymphoma, T ALL, and they had some sarcoma patients incorporated into that as well. And so I think some of those regimens are similar to what's used in adults, but some are very different. And so, um, you know, I think the biggest, um, I think, barrier to the adaptation of um, desrozoxane over the years has been concerns about second malignant neoplasms. And I think there are some who worry more about that risk in the setting of other high-dose alkylators as part of the chemotherapy regimen. Um, but, and so I guess in that way, I would say that it may be a little bit different if you were using a, a different regimen in the adult setting. That said, I do think that um, that children's oncology group study that Dr. Chow led was a very robust study um, that looked at a large number of patients with late follow-up at their cardiac outcomes and then also did a late follow-up at, um, you know, their uh, second malignant neoplasms and late mortality and did not see any signals towards increased risk for second malignancies. And so, um, so I think in that sense, you know, I think there's a lot that can be learned from the pediatric um, data and could be applied in the adult setting. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I, I'm a big proponent of that, but I don't think that, you know, you can't 100% transfer the information from children to adults and adults back to children, obviously, but uh, they do teach us very uh, important lessons. So, The Global Cardio-Oncology Summit is the leading yearly update in cardio-oncology. This year's meeting will be held in Madrid, Spain, gathering the top experts in research, science, and clinical care from around the world. The four-day event begins on September 27th with a basic and translational research symposium. On September 28th and 29th, the main sessions will take place, and this fantastic event concludes with a half-day session focused on cardio-oncology nursing on September 30th. New this year is the ICOS Champions League competition, a friendly and fun quiz event centered around cardio-oncology knowledge 
and clinical cases. The Champions League competition is open to all healthcare professionals, so make plans to join in. For more information, visit icos.org. That's I C O S dot O R G. We look forward to seeing you in Madrid this September. Treat cancer, protect hearts. And then, Will, you know, when, whenever uh, somebody's younger than 18 and they say, oh, you're a cardiologist, you know, you just look at their echo and, and you know, you can, or for that matter, even their EKG and, and say, you, you should be able to tell everything. Uh, I yeah. can honestly say that's not the case. And uh, uh, so how do you see the transition, in, you know, from sure. uh, a child to an adult, especially from an imaging perspective? Yeah, sure. I, you know, I think just from a clinical side, uh, we did a survey of pediatric cardiac centers in 2019 just to find out what sort of cardio-oncology involvement do you have. And um we found 12% of the time cardiologists were involved before therapy and about 43% afterwards. Um, and the commonest re- reason for referral to cardiologist was an abnormal EF or, or EKG or history of chemo. Uh, things like um, cardiovascular risk factors weren't, much, weren't really a big factor. So that's quite a big difference. But interestingly, only 20% of survivor um patient seen in survivor clinics had cardiology involvement so i think in the pediatric side from a clinical side cardiologists are less involved in those survivor clinic visits um, tend to get more involved once there's an abnormal test but i think that is starting to change um, in terms of our transition we we transition our patients age 20 to uh, an emory adult uh uh, it's actually called a, a young adult survivor program. And if they're in the high risk category, even if they have normal function, they are seen in a cardio oncology clinic at the outset. So um, that's sort of how we've managed our transition. And I've tried to build relationships with the cardio adult cardiologists at Emory and their cardio oncology program just to smooth out that transition. Um, one one other factor that that a lot of centers face is, for instance, us, we have we cover the whole of Georgia for cardiology. So we have 22 different clinical sites. So it's harder for us to have a physical space that's a cardio-oncology program. If someone develops dysfunction, they typically go to our heart failure program. But we've we've developed some guidelines. We have a cardio-oncology score here in Atlanta that we developed for to both help the oncologists know when to refer patients to us or when to involve us. And then also for our cardiologists, just to reduce variability to depending on their cardio-oncology score, what testing do they do? How often do they see them? So I think we we have more of a virtual cardio-oncology program here, which is just a a reality of our our center. I think some places where it's more centralized, it's easier to have a central uh, cardio-oncology clinic. But for us, we're more of a virtual program uh, with some centralization of of kids that have developed dysfunction. Um, In terms of the research, I think a lot of it is fairly similar with with us performing uh, strain and some of the same measures. Generally, they transition easily on the research side into the adult side. I think I learned a lot. We've been involved with Bonnie Key with Casey's um, study, AML 1831 study. And I think we we talk a lot of the same language. I think obviously the cardiovascular risk factor pieces is less, but it's starting to grow in our adolescence. So I think there's probably a lot of commonality between the pediatric cardiac and adult cardiac side. Yeah, I think uh, at one point I, I understood the subtleties about fractional shortening. Uh, and then at w- one other point, I might have tried to understand a Z score. But, you know, <laughs> yeah. when we when I was clearly transitioned into adult echo measurements and nobody talked about fractional shortening or Z scores anymore, you know, it, it rapidly went away. But Arjun, yeah. Uh, yeah. what happens in London or your in your surrounding area? H- how do you see these transitions occurring? 
Yeah, that, that's an interesting question. I was listening uh, with, with interest to, to what happens around the world. So I'm involved in one of the largest uh, late effect survivor programs in the UK. So basically, a lot of the patients from Great Ormond Street, which is one of the main pediatric hospitals, come to my clinic at UCLH when they transition, if they've had cardiac issues. And I'm always consulted in the general late effect survivor clinic if they develop cardiac problems later on. And one of the questions I think that you just kind of brought up at the end, Dan, about uh, Z scores and about fractional shortening, it was interesting to hear Will say that, you know, we look at strain because that's not something that we really see much from our pediatric cardiologists. They are very much still, you know, here's the echo report, this was what the fractional shortening was and et cetera. And then, as you say, this is not really something that we rely on in, in adult uh, cardiology. And, and that, that's something that I would like to maybe ask Will and Casey about as to, you know, there was a recent study that came out. I think they're going to touch upon it as well, the Dutch uh, Childhood Cancer Survivor Study, where they did look at strain. So maybe to, to you, Will and Casey, what are your thoughts about fractional shortening, Z scores, strain, what should we be doing, especially when we're transitioning on and wanting some kind of, you know, surveillance over, over the course of time? Um, yeah, well, I'll, I'll come in from the echo side. So, so echo, uh, echo physicians love new technology. So if there's a new method, whether it's strain, whether it's 3D EF, um, there tends to be a lot of excitement. And I think we are quick out of the gates with a number of small studies looking at at, at, at these. It, it's, I think there was early excitement that uh, strain would be sort of a, an early marker of impending decreased function that would allow us to intervene earlier. I think the fascinating thing from the Dutch study, it was in August, uh, Jack Cardio Oncology, you know, their the age, uh, average age, median age was 34 years, um, and they were median of 27 years out from therapy. But um, the fascinating thing to me in their study was um, 20% of the patients with a normal EF had abnormal global longitudinal strain, and 39% of the patients that had an abnormal EF had normal global longitudinal strain. So it, it sort of flies in the face that abnormal GLS always precedes abnormal EF. And I think the, the SACO trial, which was the randomized trial of adult cancer patients, you know, where they were trying to kind of monitor on a, on a GLS monitored versus EF monitored, um, their results almost make more sense when you see, see this Dutch study uh, findings. And it, 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 it kind of goes along with, with us clinically. Two days ago, I looked at an echo on an 18-year-old, was a high, uh, high-risk patient getting every two-year echoes, had an EF of 59, and the global longitudinal strain was minus 14. And, and so then you like, well, what do you do with that? And, and so I think what the, their investigators raised, which I think is really a good point, is, is, is are these measuring slightly different things? Um, certainly when they looked at risk factors uh, for the, the abnormal LBFs was more closely related to anthracycline dose versus the GLS was more closely related to radiotherapy. So I think this is more of a, I think this opens our eyes a little bit that we need to do more to understand how this dysfunction manifests um, because, you know, we might have to treat these patients differently. So I think to me that that was the fascinating part of the recent Dutch study. I think that's that's really interesting. And I think from, from your side, Casey, when you see all these new values, your cardiology colleagues throwing another thing in the report, is it helpful, unhelpful? Do you have discussions with them? How does it work? Yeah, it's a great question. I think we uh, grapple with this with our cardiologists on a daily basis. Um, we are not looking at... Um, circumferential strain yet, but we are routinely looking at global longitudinal strain in our oncology patients here in Seattle. And I think um, just based on um, conversations with the sites at our multi-institutional study, I think a lot of pediatric centers are starting to use strain in the oncology population. 
Um, but I think the question of what to do with abnormal strain or a decline in strain is still um, very much, uh, you know, an unknown in the pediatric population. So I think here in Seattle, we are, our cardiologists are typically not making a change um, just based on a decline in strain alone, but it's certainly um, a patient that we're going to follow more, more closely and have earlier involvement of our cardio-oncology team. I think when it comes on a um, more broad scale, thinking about the COG's approach to anthracycline dose modification, we're also not using strain as a indicator of um, you know significant cardiotoxicity that would make us alter our chemotherapy. Um, we're still relying on ejection fraction for that, um, but I think that's something that you know we really need to understand whether a decline in strain is significant enough that we should be trying to think about less cardiotoxic therapies. Is there an appetite in the pediatric uh, population and the pediatric uh, cardio-oncology community to maybe do a study similar, as, as Will mentioned, the SOCOR trial? you know, to look at the, the role of strain and whether that can be used as a as a prognostic marker or a modifier of, you know, potential intervention? I mean, is this something that has been discussed or is being discussed? I mean, I, I don't know what your thoughts are. Yeah, it's a great question. I think, um, you know, we certainly have a lot fewer uh, pediatric oncology patients as opposed to the adult patients. And a lot of our big trials are done in cancer consortiums. And a lot of the um, the infrastructure around that comes through, you know, drug companies that are were testing the efficacy of, of new agents um, from a cancer standpoint. So I think there are some um, barriers to overcome to try to integrate, you know, a um, question about you know cardioprotective therapy initiation or even modification of therapy within one of those. Trials, but I think um, you know I certainly think that that is something that we need to be thinking about. We are trying to learn on this um, AML study about the value of strain just in predicting cardiac dysfunction, and I hope that'll be an important step in kind of understanding the trajectory. Um, but I think uh, an intervention based on strain or ejection fraction like Succor would be very relevant to the pediatric population as well. And will yeah. is this something you you do in practice if you if you do get the strain abnormalities? I mean, you mentioned there was that patient with the abnormal strain, but the normal EF. Or how, how would you deal with such a patient? Yeah. So I think from a practical standpoint, um, the oncologists have my cell number and I have their cell numbers. So communication around those patients to have a true understanding of what's going on with the patients, uh, what were their exposures, are there other comorbidities. Right now, we've we've had a couple of patients we've recommended starting uh, treatment on. We've had generally will change their monitoring window. So whether if they're every two years, we might say, can we have a look at this patient again in six months? You know, is this something that we is changing? So I think it's a monitoring change. We've had a few patients. Um, Sorry, Armenian started to is putting out some of his data from that carbidolol trial, and. Um, you know, he, his impact, the impact of carvedilol on the LV and diastolic dimension is intriguing to me. Um, you know, again, we are guilty as, as echocardiographers of, of grabbing onto the new shiny object. And um, we've, we've collaborated with, uh, with Seattle and a number of centers to develop an echo biorepository where we've looked at these multiple patients that multiple echoes and recently um, Eric was presenting just an abstract form some of the uh, looking at some of the signals that are coming along from earlier and and they're coming from things like LV and systolic dimension and so more recently we have about 750 echoes um I think it's 88 cardiomyopathy cases with 126 closely matched non-cases and using a, a different type of analysis, a lasso technique, um, which is kind of a more agnostic way to pick a model. Um, it's quite interesting what's popping into those models. And it's I, I, I don't necessarily think the answers 
is is just in strain and these new sort of sexy measures that come on, I think often incorporating other echo measures into some sort of combined uh, predictive calculator or score to me might make more sense in an individual patient because that's really why we do most of this is about an individual patient. Obviously, research is interesting. We try to change things. But to me, that that may be more interesting rather than a change in strain of 2%. It could be, well, over the last five five years or five echoes, their LV and diastolic dimension has gone up you know, twofold or something. So it's interesting. I think we are guilty as cardiologists of always jumping to the next shiny object. Yeah, I think uh, one thing that certainly came from the Eric Chow study, but also uh, two studies that I'm aware of from St. Jude Children's uh, is that, you know, there's imaging, echo and or MRI, of course, and then uh, you know, you can focus on the various imaging parameters, including strain. And and then, but of course, when you couple that with biomarkers that, you know, if you put too much emphasis on one measure, whether it be a biomarker or an image, then I think that you sort of lose out on all these examples, you know, you, that, you know, you're, you're one individual patient who will had a basically a normal echo, but ended up with a high NT pro BNP or something and higher than uh, even what their expected age match controls may be, then, you know, these are, this is the way that you can put, you know, a couple of pieces of information together into some sort of process where you can say, yeah, this is a high risk patient. So, although I agree totally that imaging uh, you know, there's always a new measure and then we have to validate whether that new measure is good or not. That That's an unending process. And I do think that strain is getting there. It's really starting to, to be a pretty reliable indicator of a cardiomyopathy, more sensitive than EF. So I think that's, it's be, becoming to be a, an agreed upon principle. But yeah. I think adding biomarkers to that picture is really important and and you know i think that uh, that certainly applies in the adult world but i think based on like the other papers that i was just referring to uh they've proven that kind of information in in the the childhood population as well so so i think you know improving our imaging is always a good plan and and i think it's getting there for sure but uh uh, looking at other parameters that are traditionally easy to obtain, such as a biomarker, is, is usually quite helpful. Thanks, yes. Dan. That's I think that's probably a great summary um, kind of conclusion. But before we we break away, Casey, uh, could you tell us about the upcoming uh, pediatric cardio oncology meeting that are yeah. that we are hosting? Yes, absolutely. So the ICOS um, Pediatric Working Group has put together a symposium um, on pediatric cardio-oncology. It'll be October 26th from 9 to 1 EST, and we'll have a number of speakers um, both from the U.S. and abroad. And we'll be talking about cardiac dysfunction and cancer therapies, both in kind of the acute setting and their impact on cardiac function, as well as um, arrhythmias and other cardiovascular um, toxicities. And then we'll also be talking about um, cardiotoxicity in childhood cancer survivors. So it's going to be a great session, and um, it's CME credit and free to register. So we hope to see all of you guys joining us there. For more information about ICOS, you can go to ic-os.org where you'll find more information about all of our programs, including our weekly webinars, our board certification exam, and other resources that we know you'll find helpful. Thanks for joining us today, and we hope to hear from you soon.